I go to work here in the hope that I might get a bit better. Unlike tennis players or ballet dancers, we painters don't have to stop. And that's terrific. Artist Maggie Hambling. This is The Artful Painter, art lessons for artists, collectors, and people who love art. Kathleen Hudson's paintings capture fleeting moments of light and atmosphere. She says, My paintings represent specific places and moments in time. The brief point during a sunrise when the sun fills the air with an ethereal golden glow. A break in a storm where light pierces through heavy clouds. Or the sight of glacial runoff sending waterfalls down the side of a mountain wreathed in fog. Kathy artfully creates rare moments of beauty where light and atmospheric movement become sublime. When painting outdoors, Kathleen is drawn to scenes of expansiveness. She keeps an open mind as she searches for a scene that moves her. She is not afraid to paint the same scenes that others have painted before her because she is confident in her own vision and her own voice that she uses to expressively paint the landscape. As the morning kiss of light begins to illuminate the landscape before her, Kathleen Hudson's creative heart and mind comes alive with a sense of possibilities. My name is Carl Olson, and this is The Artful Painter. (music) Kathleen, I'm really happy to have you on The Artful Painter today. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. It's great to have you on. Oh, thank you. It's a joy to be here and to get to share a little bit about the process and my my thinking that goes on behind the the scenes as I'm creating these pieces. Ooh, can't Um, wait. I know. Yeah. (laughs) It's been different, of course, in the last couple of months than it was before, too, with, with the home studio. And I um, have a six month old and a five year old. So it's been more of a family affair lately. Well, there you go. <laughs> and I think you, you mentioned <laughs> that you have your six month old is with you today on the show. So we're happy to have her on the show as well. So hopefully we'll yes, hear a peep or two hear out of her. Yeah. Yeah, that would be neat. <laughs> yeah. The five year old actually played a role in the, the big competition painting I'm submitting for the Olmstead event. Oh, really? How? Um, I, yes, I was, Working, um, I spliced together several reference photos and wanted to do a big square format painting. And I had a 24 by 24 canvas on the easel and thought that was probably the size I would stick with. And he wandered into the studio, um, which is a home office I share with my husband. So not <laughs> not my typical painting space, but he, he yeah, wandered right in and looked up at the reference image on my computer monitor and told me he liked it. And I said, okay, well, thanks. That's good to hear. What size do you think I should paint it? And he looked at the canvas on the easel and said, you know, I think you should paint it bigger. (laughs) I said, okay, how how big? (laughs) And he pointed at this 36 by 36 canvas and said, I think you need to paint it that size because if you don't, then you will lose some of the details in the river. And I think those are really interesting. <laughs> Your five-year-old said this. <laughs> I thought that was pretty insightful. I actually did swap out the canvas and did 36 by 36. And he was right. It it worked better. So, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> I've certainly had a few more interruptions than I typically would during the painting process, but not all of them are unwelcome. So, <laughs> well, I think, yeah. <laughs> I think children see things in a in a delightfully wonderful way. It's advantageous to listen to them and hear their it ideas. Really, it can be. I've had some great insights come from kids. My first ever planner painting event, I was at this. Um, I was alongside a bike trail in Missouri, and a six year old wandered up, and his, I think his family was doing a picnic nearby, and he watched me painting for a while. Like so we start up a conversation. And at one point he looked at it, at the painting and said, this is looking really good. Um, but I noticed that you've painted the shadows to the fence, but not the fence. And I looked down and sure enough, I had painted some, you know, there was a fence alongside this bike trail and I had painted the, the posts shadows, but not the posts themselves. 
and had kind of forgotten and moved along. <laughs> and it wasn't, wow. you know, it, it was the kind of detail that, that I, you know, will often leave out of paintings, but because I had painted the shadows, it didn't make visual sense. So he was right. <laughs> and he picked up on it. Wow. <laughs> he did. It was, it was actually really funny. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I have had some great commentary from kids. I love it when my grandkids come over. Cause that's the first thing they want to do. Granddad, let's go down to your office. I, we want to paint. <laughs> and so you need to we, lead some impromptu art lessons. I yeah. like it. <laughs> I had one of them up on YouTube, but I took it down because of all the controversy over having kids on YouTube. I still have it, but, oh, I, I, yeah. uh, but <laughs> my granddaughter decided to do a, a watercolor tutorial. And it was so funny to watch her <laughs> and listen to her. I couldn't believe the things that she would say in the running commentary that she had about why she was using this brush and choosing this color and the design and all that. Thought, <laughs> wow. She's going to go far. <laughs> Sounds like she's been listening to her grandfather. I like it. <laughs> well, when I look at your art, when I, when I look at uh, your gallery on your website and, and elsewhere, I'm, I'm reminded of some moments uh, you, when my wife and I travel, when we travel, we like to get up early in the morning, like if it's a beach. I remember travel. That was such a nice thing to do, but I digress. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, when we would go to the beach, we would, we would like to be one of the first ones out on the beach because that's when you see the first light. You get that first kiss of light. And so it brings a glow to the beach and you kind of want that moment to linger. And that's what your paintings do. You, they, they capture those fleeting moments of light and atmosphere that I find so enthralling. I'd like to find out how that process comes about that you, you're, you capture so well those fleeting moments. Oh, well, thank you. Um, and that is the goal for me. So I love that time of day. It's why I'm drawn to sunrise paintings. You know, artists call it the golden hour because of the way the light makes everything glow. And so it lends itself to this you know, beautiful color palette that's visually appealing, but it also for me signifies a time of day that holds a lot of promise. You know, the times when I'm up early and able to, you know, to watch a sunrise and better yet be out painting it, I noticed that my, my paintings are better because I have this image seared into my mind of what, you know, what things look like right at that moment when the light first hit. And a lot of the painting is from memory. I still have a reference in front of me when I'm looking at, at features in the landscape so I can see textures, but I, there's this, frantic rush to get those initial color notes down. And I enjoy that part of it. I think it lends the painting this underlying structure that, that can also feel spontaneous because I lay it down quickly. So that's something I really do enjoy about painting early in the morning, logistically. And because it's, you know, but you get the light gets brighter as I continue painting. <laughs> so I can see my painting better. That doesn't hurt. <laughs> so, so you have the sprint at first and then you can settle down into a nice walk, as it were. Metaphorically yes, speaking. exactly. Yeah. Well, some of it, I think, is that I do paint a lot from memory anyway. I mean, I grew up painting. My parents were extremely encouraging and showered me with art supplies. And I first took lessons starting at age six from a family friend who was from Latvia. And he had been classically trained in, in uh, the Russian school. So when he came to the States to try to start his career as an artist, um, he was giving lessons um, to help try to make ends meet. So my parents were actually looking out for him more than they were trying to get me launched in an art career. Um, they just wanted to, you know, get, help them pay rent and everything. <laughs> well, look what <laughs> so happened. They got me started. I know, right? It was, yeah, they were very encouraging and I, I got a good foundation in drawing and then started painting outside in watercolors almost right away. I mean, I, in early childhood, I was painting landscapes on plein air, although I didn't know that that's what it was called. So you were going outside with, with the, I was yeah. Okay. Very early. And I even, you know, even into high school, I painted outside in oil, but didn't know that people were still doing that. Um, I, <laughs> I had gotten American artist magazine. So I remembered seeing names like, you know, Matt Smith and, 
um, you know, Scott Christensen and some of the, the, the bigger names in plein air painting. And I, so I knew that there were people who showed in galleries and painted landscape, but I had no idea that there was this big movement of people painting outside on the reg- on a regular basis. Um, and until way later. So I, I did not major in art in college. I didn't actually get much in the way of formal instruction after that initial, um, those initial lessons. And then I, I took a workshop class that met weekly from uh, when I was about 12 until I was 15. So that was my introduction to oil painting. But that, that says a lot about you were quite dedicated to do that at that young age and do it for that long. Yes. I mean, I, I look back at my childhood and I, I was all over the place <laughs> with my, my interest <laughs> and things like that. So, wow. Good for you. It was really helpful that my mom homeschooled my sisters and me. Yeah. Um, I and And she used that as an excuse to travel all over the place. She loved going to art museums, still does. Field trip. And, <laughs> yes. And, yeah. you know, so we had this kind of experiential learning. Um, she was a hi- history and English major and then taught high school after we were, you know, after we'd flown the coop. But she, she was also an Air Force brat. So she took us all over Western Europe staying with family, friends, and different connections they'd made when my grandfather was in the Air Force. And so I, we got to go to art museums all over the place. And I'd gotten to go to all 50 states by the time I was 12. You know, so I, I got a lot of travel and a, a really wide range of experience of you know, different methods of art making very early on. So that helped me, I think, focus in on some of the painters whose work I liked the most and the subjects that I really felt most moved by. So who would some of them have been at that time in your in your uh, development as an artist? I loved the Impressionist paintings and the way that they captured light. You can tell when you look at an Impressionist painting that it was created outside or that it was at least inspired and informed by lots and lots of study on location um, because of the way the Impressionists, um, particularly when they capture vibration in, in light, just by putting down marks of color that are slightly different hues, um, but the same value next to each other, they would create this sense that there really are, you know, there's atmosphere between you and a subject and the atmosphere is moving. So, you know, this landscape that, that we look at isn't a bunch of static collected elements. It's something, you know, that we can be part of since, you know, we are, we're immersed in it. We we're surrounded by the air that's acting upon the same landscape features that we're painting. So, yeah, I loved looking at, at impressionist work. My first real love when it came to painting was Sargent. I was, I think, 10 when this, the first big Sargent exhibit came through the U.S. And I remember going to Washington, D.C. and standing in front of these huge oil paintings. And it was then that I started asking my mom if I could try painting in oil. I loved his watercolors, too, but the oil, there was something juicy and kind of, you know, textural about the oil paint that I, I knew I couldn't do in watercolor. And, uh, yeah, I just remember being completely bowled over by his work and wanting to try to paint like that <laughs> or at least capture capture light in, in a way that reflected the way he, he painted. And just, you know, I, I, I still am bowled over by Sargent's work. My first three oil paintings were master copies of different Sargent paintings. And then your, one your first three oil paintings. Mm-hmm. Did I hear that right? That's right. Oh, wow. first, the first one I tried, it was not the one I would recommend anyone else <laughs> to try. You know, there, there are probably better ways to start than master copies. Which one was it? It was Carnation Lily Lily Rose. I found out only after the fact that he had started calling that painting Damnation Silly Silly Pose because it took him a full year to, to execute. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> it was painted at this 10 minute period of twilight in a backyard with all this, um, you know, all this foliage and two children as subjects. 
So you can imagine <laughs> setting up setting up that painting from life and then trying to to uh, put it together in multiple sittings. Yeah, I, I I'm I'm glad I didn't have to paint the original. <laughs> 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 but I, I did a copy, not quite the scale. <laughs> the, the original is huge. Um, but I did a copy of it and I spent a year on that copy. And my, you know, of course, my workshop instructor was going spare because it, that, that really wasn't the best way to go about learning how to paint in oil. But I learned a lot about mixing color and about, you know, and doing a deep dive into a master work like that is a great way to, you know, to pick up a skill set just to see how someone else interpreted, you know, how, how Sargent painted leaves or reflected light on a subject's face or, you know, the, there are so many elements of, of mastery that go into creating a piece like that, that you can't help but absorb some of it in, in copying it. Well, I would give anything if I'd been anywhere near close to what you were like <laughs> at that time. I, I was more into Peter Max and, and Roger Dean album covers and things like that. You know? <laughs> I had a good graphic design sense, though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, um, I, yeah, I came I, to appreciate I, I those sure things a, later. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I for sure had a non-traditional upbringing and and i i loved it i really don't know what it would have been like to not have a wider family who loved travel my grandparents were the same way my grandfather who was retired air force would devote a month out of each year several years running to taking my sisters and me in this giant conversion van out along the oregon trail so we'd drive from kentucky uh, where we live and you know drive essentially along the Oregon Trail from Missouri up you know up to Oregon and then down the California coast and we drove back along through southern states and just you know we we would stop in museums and cultural sites and national parks and I I'm pretty sure I can date my love for the landscape to those trips and you know, seeing the fans of the American West for a small child, I mean, that, it, it blew me away. And I still remember this, the sense of possibility. You know, when you look out over a landscape, see all the way to the end of the earth with the, and the sky is wide open. <laughs> I, I just, I remember driving along and, and looking out the window and, and watching, you know, watching the clouds go by and that, that kind of thing really shapes you. And so I, when I'm painting now, I'm still drawn the scenes that seem expansive or, you know, have some sort of sense of magic or possibility um, in them. So the, so the sublime is still alive. Very much. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, you know, and of course, the artists have been drawn to that in the landscape for the first century. So that's nothing new. Um, but I, I don't worry as much about a subject being something that other people have done you know the, there's nothing new under the sun for the first thing and i i also i think there's some value in in painting you know my own vision of something that really a lot of other people have found meaningful whether it's a sunrise or whether it's a big expanse of landscape you can stand next to another artist and paint the same subject and you come up with something entirely different so we all have different interpretations of, of what those subjects mean to us. And yet I, I love painting this stuff because it, it does speak to me. And it, I'm totally fine if that's a normal thing or you know, if that's a common feeling to, to, like, you know, to like the look of, of a sunrise landscape. You know, because it, it doesn't mean that my paintings will be unoriginal, but it, what it, it means is I'm moved by something that moves a lot of other people. And yeah, I, I, for me, that, that isn't something that makes me feel like the subject is less than. If anything, it makes, it makes it a little bit, you know, it makes it more moving to me. If there's something striking about, you know, a mountain uh, wreathed in fog or a landscape, you know, that first light illuminating a, um, at or the first light illuminating a landscape at sunrise. What 
what that means to me is that there are, you know, there's something about that that speaks to people across time and across cultures. And, you know, we have this innate sense that there, there is possibility and, you know, and meaning in, in a site like that. It might arrest us in our cracks, you know, it might make us stop and, and look more closely. Exactly. Yeah. And if I can make people do that when they look at my paintings, then that's, um, you know, I'll feel like I've succeeded. Well, I think you do. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I, it, it's like going into a transporter almost. It just, it's just, uh, takes you to a different place. I can, I can, I'm looking at one of your paintings right now. Uh, it's called M- Muir Woods. I would just, I could just picture myself being oh, there, yes. <laughs> you know, but I don't know if I'm <laughs> overreacting because of this COVID-19, uh, 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 not being able to go to a whole lot of places or, or, or what, but it, it's, you know, I like, I like being transported into a painting. There's a connectedness mm-hmm. there. There's a connection to the, even though I've never stood in that spot, you know, I feel like, okay, I, I'm there. I'm, I'm seeing it. Well, and to me, man, my favorite paintings are always the ones that, make you feel like you're looking through a window um, into a place so you feel transported. With that painting, that was a, that was actually a photograph that I, it was from a photograph that I took over a decade ago. And I didn't feel like I was ready to paint it until just this past year because I thought I'd Why? picked up enough of a skill set. Oh, okay. Well, painting wood, woodland interiors is a little, it, it, for me, it's a little more challenging because it's not, it's not simple and atmospheric. There's definitely atmosphere, but it's a lot more of a light and shadow style painting than something where you can use a really simple no tan type study. I found that it, it, for me, it's a lot easier to do a, a really heavily atmospheric piece with a woodland painting with an interior. There's, it's more about light and shadow and, and it's more about texture because you're painting the flora and fauna. And so I, I didn't want to try that one until I knew I could possibly pull it off because I you knew that reference photo had just been sitting, <laughs> sitting in a, my, my computer files for a decade. And I, I kept coming back to it and thinking, okay, is, do I have the skill set yet? And it wasn't until this year that I, I really felt like I got there. And that was after doing some planter painting inside, um, you know, in forest areas where I learned a lot about seeing, you know, seeing things from life, painting different textures, getting my brushwork into a place where I could be, you know, create a lot of variation. And, and so that's what I took into this Muir Woods piece. And, you know, it, it, it did feel like I really wanted to have the skill set to do it justice because that place is so special um to me it feels like a cathedral so so yeah i i really i I wanted to do it justice if i could well it's a beautiful piece it's very nice i like it oh well thank you experience in painting, I have a bit of a method to the madness where I start off looking at that value design and I'll do thumbnail sketches and small, small studies in preparation for a big work. And in the process of creating a big piece, I'll start with a, a value underpainting. And as long as I get the values to a place where it looks really compelling, then the rest of it c- tends to come together more easily. And, it, you know, of course, it's, there's no way to assure that you'll be um, totally successful with the painting, but that's a way to give you, give you a fighting chance. You know? Right. If I have a, a strong value structure underneath, then the painting almost always works. If there is something that goes wrong in a later stage, it's usually to do with color harmony and that you can fix um, fairly, you know, know, in a fairly straightforward way. But if there's something wrong with the underlying value structure, then 
it's pretty hard to to move on from there. <laughs> right. Well, and I would imagine the composition as well. Mm-hmm. The design of the of the painting too might not work. That's right. Yeah. Well, and even small differences they they add up. You know, that's that is why I do a bunch of thumbnail sketches before I do a larger painting. And I do thumbnail sketches even in the field at a plein air event. I'll do, you know, I have a sketchbook with me and I'll try a couple angles on something, a few different, you know, thinking of different canvas layouts, aspect ratios. And so I, I tried to do that just to to get the best possible angle on something and create a compelling design. Is that like a quick uh, pencil sketch or pen and ink? or? Mm-hmm. I usually do pencil. I know some people who do. Um, different grayscale markers, but yeah, I like the flexibility of being able to erase things. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, I'll use the eraser as a second drawing tool. I like that. The eraser is a second drawing tool. I hadn't thought of that. Oh, it is. That yeah, is... wipe out those highlights. Oh, just like oil man. painting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. See, that's why I do this podcast. I learn stuff all the time. That's, that's <laughs> oh, <a> good. <laughs> Edit, yeah, you think about it. Editing is really a, is a big part of anything that we do. If you're a writer, what do you do? You edit. Yeah, and I routinely will carry a pocket mirror with me when I'm out painting in the field. And I look at the painting in reverse all the time. So what do you gain from doing that? So you, you probably know the feeling of coming into the studio after maybe a day or two away. And the painting you were working on, you look at and you think, wow, there's this glaring thing wrong with it. I don't, how did I miss that? My last painting session. <laughs> and we've all been there. <laughs> yep. It happens regularly. Yikes. And so, yeah. And you think, ah, gosh, you know, that's the first thing I'll have to work on. And then you notice something else and something else. Well, what I've found is that when you, when you look at things in progress in reverse, it's like having a fresh eye. It's like looking at somebody else's painting because you're looking at a mirror image of it. So the things that your eye has adjusted to as you've been you know, staring at this canvas for a few hours, you can see in a new light. And so it's just, it's like having a level of critical removal from the painting process that enables you to step back and, you know, and really evaluate the shapes, the composition, you know, different, different choices you've made in the progress of, of painting. And so I, I do that in the studio for sure. Um, but I, I do, like I said, I even do it plein air. I take a pocket mirror with me and keep it in my painting apron and I, um, check things periodically in reverse and just see, you know, I, I'll move shapes around. Sometimes I'll notice that I've got some huge point of contrast that's outside the focal area and it's detracting from the rest of the painting or I'll, you know, have, two shapes that are exactly the same size and it's, you know, it's also distracting. (laughs) So it's like a mental reset. Exactly. It is. It is. It's just, it's a way to have some critical distance from, from your work. And that's one of the hardest things to achieve. You know, we get kind of personally invested in, in a painting while we're working on it. You know, when you've devoted a good amount of time to something, you don't want to make big changes, but yeah, it's a way to, to maintain a little bit more critical reserve and keep improving the painting, you know, during, during the actual process. So you don't have to go back later and do a bunch of edits. Well, you're, you, you seem to have a very um, disciplined process to painting. So you start, you started with, like, well, it must go back to your childhood. I, I'm still amazed mm-hmm. that you spent a year on that Sargent copy, but. I did. I, yeah. So, so, so you're, you're a disciplined person that, that serves you well. I try to be, I mean, it, yeah, it, it definitely being an artist doesn't lend itself to that because I'm in charge of my schedule and you know, there's so much flexibility in in the life of an artist that that you really you have to impose some discipline somehow and i hope not in a way that that dampens spontaneity too because there's yeah, that's that's one reason that planner painting has been so helpful is when you go out to paint something you don't ever really stick to you know to plan in a complete sense <laughs> because right. the, the weather is always a little different than you think it will be 
you might paint a slightly different location. You're probably, you know, before you arrive on, on location, you don't know exactly what size you, you're going to paint. I mean, there's, there are lots of, of decisions you make there on location that, that do lend it some spontaneity. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that's, that's one way to keep it interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you're on a, you're um, yeah, on a treasure I, hunt when you're on a plein air exactly, painting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very true. Yeah. And so I, what I've found is it's good to have a plan, but not, but to hold it loosely in my hand and not be tied to it. Yeah. So if I, if I go out without a plan, then I don't know what's going to happen. But if I have a plan that I am totally open to changing, then, you know, I'll stick with the plan until something better comes along. And sometimes it does. When I was painting in Texas at the Planner Texas event in 2018, um, we left the orientation on the first day and I had this idea in mind. I knew exactly where I was going to paint. Um, so I drove to this place 45 minutes outside of town uh, to the top of a, a hill. And there was a beautiful view of a road leading off into the distance. Mm. So I, I you know, thought I had this painting all planned out. Uh, pull off the side of this road onto a little caliche road to park. Wait, wait, wait. This, uh, what kind of a road? Caliche road is like a, it's a white, kind of a white dust, you know, white, white rock road. Oh, um, okay. In Texas, in, you know, West Texas. It's, you know, it looks like a, you guys have this, these awesome kind of reddish clay roads in Georgia. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like the white tan version of that. In I Texas. got you. Okay. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So they have, um, there's this little Kawichi road that led down to some private ranches. And so I, I was just pulling over there to park, but I looked up ahead of me and realized that was the painting, not what I had driven 45 minutes outside of town to paint. Um, and, and that ended up being my best painting of the whole week. So it was, you know, you, you can have a plan and then the course of executing that plan, you might come across something really great. <laughs> So is that uh, is yeah. that the one that's called? I see one here that's called Window on West Texas. That's the one. Yeah, that was not what I planned to paint initially. That was where I was parking to paint this other painting that you know didn't end up needing to happen. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> yep. Yeah, and it's quite large, twenty by twenty inches. It is. Yeah, for a planet yeah. painting, it's twenty by twenty. I've been going bigger and bigger, and some of that is just gaining more comfort painting out of doors. And, you know, I, I paint with a bigger, with a bigger brush set than I used to. So I've, instead of painting small and sticking with really small brushes, what I'll do is kind of make a bigger statement with broader brush strokes at the beginning. And I'll often have a very focused area of detail in a painting that, you know, where I, I do break out some smaller brushes and, and put in a little more detail. But I'm, I try to be pickier about where that is on a painting. Do you ever take your outdoor paintings and do they become an even larger painting indoors or do, or do they stand on their own? For me, it depends. You know, if I do a large painting outdoors, then I will try to go ahead and finish it. I don't have to finish it on location unless it's at one of these plenary events. But I, I do try to go ahead and bring it to a finish if it's a large scale one. If it's a small study, then the purpose is more to build up some notes for a larger work. So I might use a smaller planner painting in conjunction with some photos to scale it up and create something bigger. So, and I, I do a lot of that too. So the, and that was the initial reason that artists went outside and did planner painting. It was really to learn more than to create a finished product um, for, for the collector. Um, but you know, it, it can work both ways. I've, I, the paintings that I do at events, I always bring to a level of finish that is really the same as I, as I would submit for a gallery show because I know it's going on someone's wall and I, you know, I have the, the time and the margin to create something big. So it's, it is, it's really kind of exhilarating to go big outside. <laughs> I, I enjoy it. I mean, you have, you have the time pressure and I, I, I know that for some folks, the time pressure of painting on location uh, and especially painting at a plein air event adds, adds stress and, you know, doesn't make the process better for them as an artist. But 
I'm I'm more in the camp where I find it it improves my painting because I'm making my decisions more more efficiently. Like I have to really get into a zone where I'm I'm making good decisions and economizing my brush strokes, which tends to make it for a more dynamic painting. You know, I don't have endless time to keep correcting things in the studio and so that uh or like like I do in the studio and so in a way it can lead to a painting that looks fresher um so so yeah there are different strengths to painting inside versus out and I with you know with the paintings that I do I just try to create or, or use whatever the strengths of a given situation are to make the best possible work and yeah I knew in the studio I, I have tried to replicate some of the, the things that make planner paintings so vibrant by trying to limit the time I spend in a certain stage of painting or by um, using a video instead of a still image on my monitor. How did that idea come about? I think it, the first time I um, realized that could be useful, you know, I started doing video of for my ocean painting reference. So anytime I was out getting photo reference for seascapes, I would get some video loop because the, you know, the, inspiration for that is that you really can't quite capture the exact point in a wave that's most dynamic because you don't know how each wave is going to break. They're all different. (laughs) So, so what I found was I was, I could either take burst photos or get a video and have, and find the exact right point in the wave that just, you know, that caught the light in a way that seems more unusual or more evocative. So I, I started doing that. I also, I, um, around the same time I was doing some equine paintings and horses are almost impossible to photograph. They don't stand still. Well, yeah, they do not stand still. Yeah. And I found that when I was taking still photos at, at Keeneland, I live in Lexington, so I'm close That's where to the horses are. The thoroughbred racing. Yeah. yeah. So I, I was out getting some photo reference and realized that using video stills was a lot better than trying to capture a horse at exactly the right point in their stride because at certain points in a horse's stride they look awkward and gangly even though on the whole they're very graceful animals and so i i found that it was a lot better to use a a video and that way i could pause it and you know get a screen capture at exactly the right point in their in their gait and it you know and create a, a more interesting painting that featured their, you know, their musculature in the right way. Um, so I, that was something I started doing with horses and then in seascapes and I've done it with other things too. I, I just, I find that when you have a few video loops, it doesn't have to be long. It can be 15 seconds. If it's an ocean, if it's an ocean scene, I might get a photo or a video rather for each wave, you know, just to show the whole of the wave breaking. And, and I'll combine elements of several different video stills and, and, you know, find the the point you know, sometimes the wave will break in such a way that it kicks up a lot of spray in one place. And it, you know, looks really dramatic. And so I, I paint that and the, but then, you know, maybe 10 minutes later, there was another wave that did something really interesting on a different you know, part of the rocks where it's breaking. And so you can incorporate that into the piece too. <laughs> you know, so. Right. So you, t- so you take that video now and, and then what you're doing is you're, you're selecting the frame that's going to work for the painting. And then what's displayed on your monitor is, is that single frame or are you looping the video on your monitor I as you paint? I both actually. I try oh, cool. to, you know, when I'm creating the composition, I might look at several stills. Yeah. And, or if I'm doing some detail on a wave later on at the end of the process, I might go back to a still. But when I'm creating, um, when I'm doing the bulk of the brushwork, I try to actually keep a video running on loop because the story in a seascape is really the motion of the water more than the exact form. Because no two waves are alike. You know, no one, no one looking at your painting is going to know exactly how that wave broke on that day. So you don't need a portrait of, of a specific you know, photo reference of a wave so much as you need to capture the sense of movement in the water. You know, how, do, how does the water move and reflect the sky? You know, how, what does it look like when it crashes against a certain outcrop of rock? And, 
and that's really the story of the painting, not, you know, not what a specific wave did on, you know, 3.30 PM on a Thursday, on Thursday. So it's, I, I think that's really why the, the video reference is such a help because you do see that movement. So it replicates the experience of painting plein air. Are you also playing the sound at that time? You... <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. If, if it, if it really helps immerse me back into the feeling of being there on location, then, then yes, sometimes I, I will go ahead and play the sounds too. And that's, that's always fun. Who <laughs> doesn't like listening to the ocean? Well, I'm glad you, you validated uh, what I was thinking about. I thought maybe <laughs> it was going crazy, but. Nope. And you know, I'm not the only one to do it. I was, um, I had done this for a couple of years and then I, I was watching um, Don Demers, the seascape painter from Boston, um, I was watching a, a video he had done on painting seascapes, and he he does the same thing. He gets some film, you know, some short film reels of sea, of waves breaking, and uses those as painting reference. So I I felt like I wasn't you know <laughs> wasn't the only <laughs> crazy loon out there painting from video. <laughs> So if anybody accuses you of painting from photos, you say, I do not paint from yeah. photos. Okay, I Don paint from video. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, I'm, I, oh. I, I'm totally for any tool that's available to an artist to create the image that they have in their heart <laughs> to put on canvas. Definitely. Yeah. Photoshop is also really useful. Yeah. I, I do lots of stuff with tweaking reference photos in Photoshop before I'll start painting. What's in your toolbox, Kathleen? Easel wise, um, I I have a couple, and my favorite one is Josh Bean's Prolific Painter setup. And that's just the reason I love that one is that you can go really big with it. So he um, you know, it comes in two in two parts. There's a palette that you attach to a tripod, and then you connect a panel holder or canvas holder to the top of a tripod and you can go up to 36 inches vertical. So it's a lot. I do like that one a lot for smaller work and in quick studies, edge pro, which is based in Chattanooga. They do great little Peshad box easels and they have a glass palette that's well cradled. So that's fun because then you don't have to worry about stashing it and not cleaning things out. So for quick studies, that one is, is really nice. So I, I sort of use the two based on what I'm, aiming to do you know the larger prolific painter setup is you have to have something that size to paint large outside you can't use the facade box and paint anything over you know 16 by 20 and even that would be pushing it josh bean's uh setup is really nice especially for tall people too because you you can get your hand way down on the bottom edge of the canvas without bumping into the Peshad box. If you had a traditional That's Peshad right. box, you don't have any working distance down there. But with that, you got it up high and and you can really get down there without having to, to bump your hands in the paints. Yes. Yeah, and there are a couple of tweaks. You know, I know that people sometimes don't like having the flat palette separate from the panel holder because it means the sun can get on the palette when even if you're painting with your your uh, your canvas in the shade and there's a pretty easy hack around that and that's get a couple plastic clamps and a car sunshade and you can clamp it to both sides of the palette and the tripod and then you're in full shade so it then it doesn't really add much at all in terms of weight to your pack so there are some ways to do that <laughs> um, yeah that's a good hack yeah and then, so I'll do that. I do, I carry an umbrella now. I didn't used to, but yeah, I've found that I, it's just nice to not have to worry about finding shade or angling the easel around if there's something really great to paint. 
from a certain vantage point. You know, I, I had been picking my vantage points a little bit based on the lighting conditions of the easel, and that's that's not something you want to have to do. So I got a best umbrella for that, and then I used Michael Harding paints. Um, those I started using about, I guess, five years ago. Came across their ultramarine blue, and I was sold. I mean, that's my workhorse color. How is it different from the other colors? There are, uh, they don't use any filler in their paint at all. Um, so it's pure, you know, pigment plus the the oil paint or the um, the linseed oil or safflower, depending on the specific paint. And I I've found that it is it it just has such a high tinting power that I don't have to use as much of it in mixes as I would um, some other brands and even some brands that are equally expensive. So, um, and then they also make these really beautiful synthetic colors. I, I use a palette that has a lot of modern colors more so than, you know, than earth tone. Like what, what would be on your palette? So like Indian yellow oh, is yeah. one of my favorites. And that one varies so much brand to brand, you know, with, with a color like cadmium red light, you, you, once you get into a certain tier of, of paint brand, they, they're fairly similar and there, there are slight differences you might notice from brand to brand, but overall it's going to be pretty yeah, it's similar. close. Yeah. You can work with it yeah. with, um, yeah, with a synthetic color though, like Indian yellow, there's a lot of variation brand to brand and some brands, Indian yellow is almost the, kind of burnt orange color. The Harding Indian yellow is this really um, beautiful color that when you mix it with white, looks like a cad yellow deep. And so I've actually, uh, I use cad lemon on my palette, but I've replaced all the other cadmium yellows um, and even cad orange with Indian yellow. And one of the cool things that you can do with the synthetic color is you can mix really dark tones with it in a way that you can't mix cadmium because they are opaque and they'll lighten any you know anything you mix it into. And you can also create almost a glazing effect even when you're painting plein air or ala prima. So you can you know have an opaque because of it's got um, the transparency section. in it. Yeah. Yeah, and so I'll just take a brush and drag a little bit of this transparent color over something that's opaque, and voila, it's luminous like a watercolor. You know, so that's that's really a fun thing to do. Um, the Michael Harding, a lot of the synthetic colors that they make, um, including the Indian yellow and then a magenta are so, are so bright. In fact, such a punch that you can mix almost any color from them. So I use, I use those as the backbone of my palette along with titanium white, obviously. And then I also have a neutral gray on my palette and that's been really helpful. Um, especially painting out of doors because it sort of gives me a starting point. You know, if I'm looking at color mixes on my palette, the time of day and the temperature of the light, you know, whether it's warm, early or late light, or whether it's the cool blue light at midday, it can make, it can make things look really different on the palette. And, you know, uh, any of us who've done planner painting have had the experience probably of painting something that looks really light and high key outside and then you take it inside and it looks like you've created a dark gray mess. Yeah. <laughs> so having a neutral gray on the palette can help me as a sort of a reference point. Is it a neutral so gray out of the tube or, uh, or you mix it? It is. It's pre-mixed gray. Okay. So that's another Harding paint. Um, Gamblin also has a line of, of pre-mixed grays that are nice. And then I use um, Gamblin's, what is it called? Oh, it's the solvent free gel yeah. as a painting medium. And yeah, that one's nice because it doesn't dry like glue on your palette and it you know gives the paint some gloss, increases the fluidity a little bit, but it still retains most of its character. So, so yeah, I, I like, I like those things in terms of, of supplies to have painting outside. Well, uh, I, I noticed in just looking at a few of your paintings, uh, one, one thing that, I like is it looks like some of the colors are not completely mixed. Does that make sense? It, it's, it seems like rather than doing a, and I know artists have, have different approaches and, and I'm not saying one's better than the other. Like I've, I've seen, you know, Scott Christensen just 
spend a considerable amount of time uh, making uniform puddles of colors. And some other uh, artists like to just, just, you know, barely mix it enough so that some of the original colors that were paired together are still visible in the paint stroke. And that seems to be evident in some of your paint strokes as well. Mm -hmm. Am I off base with that? Not at all. Yeah. When I mix paint, I, um, I almost always pre-mix my colors with a palette knife just so I create big enough piles of paint. And that is the number one thing I see in workshops. (laughs) When I, when I teach, it's so hard to get folks to create a big enough pile of paint. And I I notice the same thing when I'm painting, you know, I'll try to get by, you know, skimping a little bit on, on paint sometimes. And it's, it's a battle to mix these giant piles of paint at the outset of a painting session. Um, but if you do it, you won't regret it. And so I, I do that. And when I mix it with a knife, I just make a point of not quite mixing everything into one, you know, one uniform color tone. I'll leave little striations of, of different pigments in some of my color mixes. So when I pick them up with the brush later, I can load up my brush well and lay down the stroke that has some interest in it. You know, it kind of creates a bit of a marbling look. And those are fun things to do because it, it doesn't necessarily change anything about the overall structure of the painting. And when you step away from it, you may not see it, but it, what it, what it does is, you know, if you create a painting that's compelling and has a good composition, a good value design, then you want to give somebody a reward for coming up to it. You know, they'll, they'll be drawn to it because of its overall design. But when they walk up, you want to, you want to kind of keep them looking at your painting. So creating I think Kwang Ho may have called it eye candy. I forget somebody said yeah, that. Yeah, I've heard somebody some use that phrase. Thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, creating some, some interest uh, goes goes beyond, you know, just the the subject matter or a detail area or something. It's really, you know, it's helpful to create some some marbling and some interesting texture in the painting that rewards someone for coming and taking a closer look. Um, so yeah, that's certainly intentional that I don't overmix my paint. I'll especially do that with things like rocks or subjects that have some natural variety. What type of surfaces do you like to paint on? I mix it up a little bit. I mean, my, my most common surface for plein air painting is the Centurion double prime linen. And, and I like it. It has, you know, it's a fairly smooth linen texture. It has some tooth to it. Um, and I like using oil prime because I do an underpainting that involves some wiping down of highlights. So I'll, I'll, uh, you know, bring it back to the, the white of the canvas. The Centurion is double primed with an oil ground. And yeah, that one is, it's a really quick cover canvas because it is smooth. So you can, you have some texture, but you can cover it really quickly in the field. And that's a plus. Um, is that going video, on a panel? Is that going on a panel or is it stretched? It does. They make it, you know, it's a, uh, it's an exclusive, I think from Jerry's artorama and in, um, in North Carolina. And yeah, so they put that on an MDF panel. Um, so that's, that's kind of a good option. It's not super expensive. So, you know, for, for those of us who, are you know sometimes I find that if I'm painting on something that costs me fifty dollars or more, especially getting to the bigger sizes of canvas, then I might be a little more hesitant to you know while while painting, <laughs> and that's never a good thing. Yeah. You want you want to feel a little bit of a sense of abandon when you're painting, especially under time pressure outside. So yeah, I do find that one to be a good good basic canvas. I also like the Blick. Um, Belgian linen for a, a canvas that has a little bit more tooth to it. So if I want something that has some more texture, then that's a good one to go for. Um, if I'm if I'm mounting my own canvas in the studio, I really love some of the Clausen's linens, and they have I have some that have more texture, like the 66. One of my other favorites is the 13 double primes from Clausen's, and that's that's a Belgian linen as well. There are quite a few. It's fun to experiment. 
I'm always fascinated by it. Uh, there's so many different choices, and sometimes I can get into analysis paralysis, deciding what surface I want to paint on. <laughs> you know? uh, yes, that's true. There are lots of options. Yeah, but, but that's a good problem <laughs> to have. Now, you were scheduled to come to Atlanta, but that didn't happen because of the present global situation. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, you do have a, a wonderful array of, of paintings in their virtual online gallery there so it's interesting to see oh, how you. yeah you know I'm, I'm sure a lot of these events are having to reinvent themselves or as Olmstead likes to say uh, you know they're reimagining how the event mm -hmm. works yeah, so, yeah. they've done a great job with it well I, I hope you get to come to atlanta in a, at a future date i would love to but yeah they've taken the step of just inviting this whole same slate of artists to the event next year um so they'll, well, that's, that's going to be there their event. So I, I plan to be there. Hoping things feel much more normal by that point. Well, I'm looking forward to your interpretation of Georgia then when you come. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. For sure. Yeah. Well, I love that they've opened it up um, widely too. So instead of giving people very specific places to paint, they really want folks to look far afield in Georgia. I mean, there's so many beautiful things within the state. So yeah, they, um, the plan this year was for us to, spend a couple of days painting anywhere within the state for the first, um, you know, the first period of time before moving in towards Atlanta. And yeah, so I'm, well, I'm sad that won't get to happen. I hope, hopefully that's still going to be in the cards for next year. There's a lot of beautiful places in Georgia. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's an understated state. You know, it's not like going to Colorado and you, or Utah, <laughs> right. where you got those massive mountains and red cliff rocks and things like that. But uh, it does have a lot of beautiful hidden corners uh, that deserve to be painted. So I mm -hmm. look forward to having you out here. Kathleen, I, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk with me on The Artful Painter. It's been a real, real pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, too. I am truly grateful to Kathleen Hudson for taking the time to speak with us today. I know she's very busy. She's a full-time artist and she's a full-time mother. And that is a heavy load, I know. And yet she took a bit of that precious time away from her children, away from her painting to talk to us. I loved her enthusiasm. I loved her positive attitude. She was very gracious. I was sorely tempted to publish an unedited cut of our interview. It was hilarious. Her children made cameos <laughs> throughout the interview and it just cracked me up. It was it was such a fantastic experience. Be sure to check out Kathleen's website. It's at KathleenBHudson.com. There's a link in the show notes and blog post. You can also see her entries into uh, the Olmstead Plan Air 2020. You can go to OlmstedPlanAir.com. You can view the Olmstead Gallery Catalog. There you will see several of her beautiful paintings that are available for sale. And some have already sold. So to those that have bought them, uh, we're, you know, I'm sure the Olmstead uh, board is quite grateful to you and the artists are as well. But it's a beautiful gallery. I encourage you to check it out. Again, I have a link in the blog post. I'd like to take a moment to share this feedback from Carol Rourke. Her subject line says, Southern Greens. <laughs> oh, this is going to strike me in my heart. I know it is. She says, hi, Carl. Just finished your podcast with John Lasseter. Great discussion as always. I felt your pain when you mentioned the Georgia Greens. Being from Mississippi, I definitely sympathize with you. Many years ago, a mentor of mine who had studied extensively with Henry Hinchy asked me why I wasn't painting the landscape. I told him that I just wasn't inspired by the Mississippi landscape, and I felt I needed to be in the mountains or the desert southwest to be a landscape painter. He then gave me some of the best advice ever. He looked at me and said, what do you know about those places? You have lived in Mississippi all of your life. It's part of you, and you have never opened your eyes. He pointed at a window and said, there is a painting in every pane of that window. You just have to look. I have been looking ever since, 
And even though those southern greens frustrate me time and time again, what a joy is in the challenge of finding the magic in them. Thanks again for your great podcast, Carol. Well, thank you, Carol, for that feedback. It did give me pause to think about my um, prejudice, I guess, against painting Georgia greens. I have to admit, a lot of times when I look at the green landscape, I'm I'm actually singing in my head <laughs> Kermit the Frog's song, It Isn't Easy Being Green. But that's good advice. Uh, There's a painting in every pane of that window. You just have to look. I like that. And I appreciate you sharing that with me. One day, perhaps, I'll come to grips with it. But it's going to take a lot of baby steps for me to get there. Now, I can see from browsing Carol's website that she has indeed applied that lesson well. Her artwork is beautiful. She has a nicely done website. I encourage you to go check it out. It's at carolrourke.com, and I will provide a link in the blog post and show notes for this. Just an interesting side note, uh, her website is very beautifully done, and this is the first time I've seen an artist's website that is hosted and put together by the GoDaddy website builder. I've never heard of that. I've never seen that. So uh, well done, Carol. It's very nicely done. I do want to mention that last week I had an editorial faux pas. I had a rather embarrassing cliffhanger when I was sharing feedback from artist Debbie Mueller. You know, I just got right to it and then I stopped. <laughs> and I had intended to share her website information, and but inexplicably I followed a mental squirrel and I jumped into the next segment. Yeah, my brain short circuits a good bit like that. So I want to apologize to Debbie Mueller and also to my listeners for that faux pas. I have corrected the audio and I've uploaded a new copy. Now, unfortunately, I was not able to upload a new YouTube version of the podcast. YouTube does not allow me to uh, replace an existing video. Now, I could delete the video and then create a new video, but then I would lose all the stats and comments for that. I just decided to leave it in place. In case you missed it, please check out Debbie Mueller's website at, no, this is not a cliffhanger. (laughs) Please check out Debbie Mueller's website at DebbieMuellerArt.com. There is a link once again in the show notes for this. Please note that I have fired the editor and the producer of this show. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to find a replacement for him, so I continue to work as the editor and producer of The Artful Painter. I want to thank at this time the associate producers of The Artful Painter. They have not committed any faux pas. In fact, they have supported me with their generous financial donations. This includes... Jeffrey Eichhoff, Colleen White, Alan Bloom, Jim McVicker, and Frank Wash. If you would like to join my roster of associate producers, go to carlolson.tv slash donate. I love hearing from everyone. You can send me a note, ask me a question, share your experience, and of course, be sure to include a link to your website. I might mention it. Go to carlolson.tv and click the contact tab. Thank you for listening to this edition of The Orful Painter. I'll see you in the next episode.